Ladies and gentlemen, Hugo Moline. Architecture has always been used to make cities in the interest of only the powerful few, those with the means to buy, build and hire. That means that really the rest of us are left out of the conversation. So the majority of us live out our lives in someone else's city. We sleep in apartments built for developers, we work in offices designed for corporations, and we seek recreation in places designed for those who want to sell us something. But while most architects busy themselves putting a pretty face to this spatial dictatorship, a growing number of architects are seeking to re-engage with the city itself by working with the people who actually use the places they design. About eight years ago, a group of young Thai architects began to work with people seeking shelter underneath Bangkok's highway overpasses, building their own houses under there. Working, working with this group of architects, the people became really their own architects. They made models and plans. They worked out how the houses would go on site. They worked out the relationship of the different houses to one another. But the local housing authority blocked their plans. They didn't think that these people would be capable of developing their own solution. So they showed them. They built the houses on the steps of the housing authority. <laughs> then they held a music festival until they finally got the land and were able to build their community for real. In the artificially divided city of San Diego, San Diego Tijuana, Teddy Cruz works to um, kind of expose and confront spatial injustice on both sides of the border. The maquiladoras, these uh, massive uh, assembly plants, have come across the border to take advantage of the low wages and close proximity to Californian consumers. The workers have to house themselves wherever they can on the hillsides nearby. Cruz has identified one of these maquiladoras who makes industrial shelving and used their components to make a proposal system that was a kind of a structural base that the people could then build their houses from. The really clever thing about this proposal is that it uses the technology of the company to both expose the massive injustice being perpetrated but also come up with a perfect PR solution, ready to go, step by step, all planned out. In New York, the City Center for Urban Pedagogy makes these kind of public investigations that ask critical questions of the city, like who decides about public housing and where does all the garbage go that's produced in New York City? When you're working up against capital and bureaucracy, it gets a little bit hard to get paid. So you have to kind of patch together whatever you can from wherever you can. Cultural grants, private donations, a little bit of paid work where you can get it. In Sydney, we're equally in need of such new approaches. Hous housing affordability is in total crisis in Sydney at the moment. Some of the most unaffordable housing anywhere. And developers often use this fact to argue for more land releases. But the fact that we've already pretty much paved over our entire agricultural food basin and we have totally insufficient public transport means that making Sydney bigger is not going to solve the problem. Especially when you consider that the houses these developers are building are now officially the largest in the world. We've, we've, we've coupled a, a lack of affordable housing with a totally irrational excess of interior space. But solutions to these problems are coming from the people often blamed for them. Recently, I've been working with Capit Bahayan, a Filipino housing cooperative based in the western suburbs, on the design of some of these alternatives. The, the cooperative is a form of public housing, but managed and maintained by the tenants themselves. The six new houses will incorporate strategies for passive heating, cooling, lighting, water collection and material reuse. Each has a private courtyard and a sunny patio and together share a library, communal deck, vegetable garden and plenty of shared informal gathering spaces. Through such strategies of mixed use and sharing, Cabot Behind is able to comfortably house six families where normally there would be two. 
and they're able to actually gain access to more of the site each than they would by dividing it right down the middle. This five-story high concrete woman was made by Armando Garcia Munoz as a additional bedroom to his house in Tijuana. <laughs> she shows us that, you know, it is possible to build the city of our dreams. That <laughs> Thank you.